please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, I can. Yes, we can. Yes, All we right. can. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get to um, you know, speak to you today. Uh, today we'll be looking at user research, right? Yesterday we looked at uh, problem thinking, you know, design thinking. So, I mean, just to trouble our memory, right? Um, perhaps you can just unmute your mic. You know, people were yes yesterday. Kindly share what you learned yesterday, right? So at least other people can learn. So you can unmute your mic. Tell us what you learned yesterday. Okay, I learned I learned that uh, design thinking is is a process of uh, building solutions or coming up with solutions that are both useful and relevant to the users, and to be and the processes of design thinking involves empathizing with the user, defining goals that are related to the business, uh, the user goals and the uh, product goals. I also learned that we need to ideate come up with possible ways of solving the problem then pick the most viable one create prototypes and then test hello Hi. Yeah, so we also learned that, you know, design thinking it just really involves um, the use and relevance and not like the aesthetics, like the use and re relevance of the products, like with respect to the user's problems, if you get what I mean. Yeah. We also, we also like dived into like the um, various... Um, various subs of product management there's research there's planning building releasing refining and uh retiring so yeah that's basically what we did Oh, can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Yes, yeah, oh, I can hear yeah. you. Oh, so sorry. So sorry. I, I didn't know I was muted. All right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you, everyone. So I said uh, from, in your own words, we, let's have two people who can share with us um, what they understand by user research, right? Um, I'm sure you must have heard user research, you know, in the past, probably when you were surfing on the internet you know or just in plain words like from what it denotes you know what do you understand by user research so let's have two people who can you know on media mics okay. and just tell us all okay. right go ahead yes okay. please so i i believe user research um from the word means conducting findings about the problems and the pain points of your users what they actually need that you are trying to provide for them. I think it's trying to find out more about your target market. That's what I think it is. Very good. 
Uh, one more person. Let's have one more person. Um, hello, good evening. Hi, good evening. Yeah. Okay, I think user research is more like um, knowing um, the, the user's wants from this app. It's just like just like when you're using an app and then you have this person that says, um, um, can you read this app for us? That kind of thing. And after reading, they give a feedback of, of your opinion on the app. So I think that it's, that's what user research is all about. Like the users giving their own opinion about the app. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. very good. Very good attempt. Uh, thank you very much for that. All right, um, everyone has spoken very well. So let's delve uh, deep, deeper into you know, what our agenda for today is. So user research answers a very critical question, right? And the question is, who am I building for, right? For all the products in the world, right? At the point of development, you must always consider who am I building this for, right? So it's user research helps in answering this question and much more, right? And then, you know, I define user research as every form of data gathering, right? It could be direct, that is directly engaging the customer, or it could be indirect, right? So uh, doing this for, for people who use your product, right? And then why are you doing user research? To drive product growth. So at the core of your work as a product manager, the, everything you do revolves around product growth. How can this product get to the next level? How do we earn more revenue? How do we get more users? So those are growth metrics, right? So at the point of you being interviewed in an organization and they ask you, okay, tell us, you know, what do you understand by product growth or how are you how are you going to help our company grow, right? You, would, you need to emphasize the fact that user research is one of the tasks or one of the processes that you'll be, you know, starting with to, to, to be able to achieve that milestone, right? So don't forget that keyword, growth, right? That's what basically, essentially what we are going to achieve eventually when I go deeper into what uh, the product manager does. So, Users are at the center of everything, right? So from revenue to the business model to the design, you are doing all of this because of users, right? Without users, you can't make money. Without users, your business model will not fly, right? And even when you are designing like your, your interface, right? You have to consider your users, right? So, and then the other thing you also want to consider is, which I did as a, which I added here as a metaphor. So a product without users, is like a city without people, right? And I'll give you um, something very, something we can all relate with, right? So if you look at your screens right now, um, I don't know if you are familiar with this site, right? So there's something they call ghost, the ghost cities of China. So these are buildings, right? Massive uh, residential constructions, right? that have been built, uh, you know, with the purpose of having people use, you know, come in, rent, own, right? And till now, these buildings have not been occupied, right? You have 6 million housing units, you know, of this form that are not occupied by users. So imagine the amount of money engineers had to spend to construct this, and then at the end of the day, after 20 years, you're not getting anything, right? So that's to tell you that before you start anything as a product manager, you must first think of the user. Are they going to use this? Is this something they want? Is this something they can spend on, right? You have a lot of apps, mobile apps that are redundant. You have a lot of um, Web3 projects that are not really solving any critical problem. And why is this? It's because at the foundational stage, user research was not properly done, right? So. We'll be going to the next stage. Um, you now ask yourself, you know, at what point do you engage with users, 
right? At what specific points do you engage with users? And there are three stages. You have the conceptualization stage, you have the development stage, you also have the release stage, right? And these three stages are very important in the product life cycle, right? So the first stage, let's look at conceptualization. Now, at the point of you thinking of an idea, right? Probably you are you, are, you were hired in a startup that um, intends to probably create a new product. And probably, or you could even have a scenario where um, the product has not been properly concept conceptualized and they're hiring you as a product manager to just come in and, you know, do the right thing, you know, to help the product grow, you know. So as a product manager, during the conceptualization stage, you want to consult with users. How do you do this? The first thing you need to think about is surveys. Right. This is the point where you ask people like, oh, um, what what are the problems you're facing? Uh, would you like, to, is there a mobile app that does this for you currently? You know, all of that. Then you also want to examine consumer trends, right? So there are a lot of um, news agencies that release statistics about users. So if you check PwC, you check KPMG, you find a lot of statistics around um, consumer trends, you know, they'll tell you in the next 25 years, people will no longer use their mobile phones, they'll use something else, you know, tell you that, oh, within the next 30 years, people will no longer use cars that use fossil fuels, right? So you want to also keep your eye on that so that while you're building your product, you're factoring it into all of the things that make, would make it work. That is, you're considering the user at the foundational stage, right? Now, what this also does is it ensures product market fit, right? So I'm sure you would hear people talk about market fit, product market fit. Essentially, they are talking about the users, right? You don't want to build what users would not use, right? That is the crux of user, user research, right? Now, the next stage where you, you know, do this is also the development stage, right? So at the point of building the products, right, you must engage users to ensure that the solution built matches their desire, right? So say for instance, um, I I want to build a mobile app that helps people uh, with um, maybe going to the gym, right? Say that's the product, going to the gym, right? After I've examined the reasons why they will use the app, the problems, the, the pain points they have at the moment, and why my product is going to fit, why this app is going to be the best thing that will ever happen to them. At the point of developing the app, I want to now go back to them and say, looking at this wireframe, does this help you to achieve your, your desires, right? You know, you want to have some sort of, you know, we talked about prototyping yesterday, right? This stage is, where you want to consider that, right? You want to be able to show the user a prototype and say, okay, run through this. Um, how will this help you in achieving your goals? Um, say you want to order, you want to be able to order a ride, and I have a mobile, mobile app that can do that. I want to be able to simulate the process that, okay, this is a wireframe. When you click on this, what does it show you? Okay, if you're trying to order a ride, where would you tap, right? If you're trying to um, contact support, how well are you? How, how well is the user able to assess all of those features, right? So you don't essentially need to build the entire thing, right? You don't essentially need to have a full-fledged product before testing. Testing can commence from the point of wireframing, right? And I'm sure in, you, in the point of your study, you must have seen um keywords like wireframing you know low fidelity wireframing or high fidelity wireframing the person that does this for you is the is the ui ux designer right so you have an idea you tell your designer about it you sketch out something for the designer the designer makes it into some sort of um a mid or high fidelity framework now the designer can map it into a prototype put together a strange of all of the screens right and then you call a user that oh, okay this is a potential user of this product. Share the link with them and 
see how they interact with it, right? Examine what they do while using the prototype. You realize that the lessons you are going to learn from that process would save you a lot of heartaches or a lot of problems you would have faced if you released the product and then you did not do proper prototyping or proper testing, right? So let me ask a general question. Let me ask a general question. Have you ever used a product and then while, I mean, this is a product in like in the open, probably on the mobile app, it could be Instagram, it could be Facebook, and then you're trying to do something and then it was not just, you could not do it. It was either hanging or was showing you some sort of error or, you know, it was just not going through. Who has that experience? Uh, please, you know, I would like you to share. You know, what product have you used recently and you just did not like your experience using that product? Let's hear. It could be any type of products, physical products, digital products, you know. You cannot meet your mic and let's hear you. Hello, everyone. So um, my experience that I'm sharing is um, for a digital product. It's a fintech app. I do not want to mention like brand name. So uh, when I ventured into product management, I started seeing things from, um, you know, an end user POV. And lately, I have been asking myself a lot if um, all the fintech apps that are just coming up and down, they're actually solving problems of cross-culture or cross-border payments, rather. So there was a particular time I wanted to, I think everybody experienced this, I wanted to make some transactions and because um, virtual cards were on hold and stuff like that, everything I needed to do could not work. I couldn't buy a domain name, I wanted to buy, everything was just on the post and it was not very clear. I understand that it's a Nigerian problem or whatever, I don't really know, but it just it's just sad that most of the time there are restrictions on you know, foreign payments and transactions and we have these fintech apps, a lot of them always coming and, you know, making it seem or proclaiming that they are solving, you know, the problem of um, cross-border payments, but in reality, they are still constrained. So I really hope that one day, you know, this Wahala will be a thing of the past. So, yes, <laughs> All right. that's my well, experience. Thank you for that. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's hear another person. Um, okay, recently, um, mine is also um, a banking app. Recently, I was, and it's not just a Nigerian problem because I'm in Ireland. And so I was trying to just make it simple. I was trying to buy some coins. And okay. it was just, the app was not even opening. And then it was telling me to change my team. It was so frustrating. And then they now sent a message that, oh, their network was down. And even the next day, their network was still down. I was just, I was beyond living. Yeah, <laughs> all right. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that feedback. Right. Uh, so, largely, a lot of the problems users face when you've re you have, re like, the product is in the market, a lot of those pro problems could have been prevented if proper testing was done right at the point of development right so as a product manager one mistake you don't want to make is shipping a product that has not been properly tested right you can write this down on your notes you can put this at, on your reminder anywhere you just put this as a very very important um, um pointer never ship a product that has not been properly tested right that's very very critical right and by testing it doesn't mean um oh you call your friends or you are just the one doing the testing right you also want to look for other scenarios that okay let me look for my friend who is trying to buy something from abroad let him try this let me hear what he would say if this product really um solves their problems right so that that's been noted um the the third thing the release stage right so at the point of go to market, when you, you are really like you are about to launch the product, or even post release, that is maybe after you've launched the product, say two months, three months down the line, right? You also want to hear from your users. 
Why? Why must you do this? The two things I pointed out is for the purpose of reiteration, right? Um, I'll give an example of reiteration. What Facebook looked like two years ago, three years ago, is there for what Facebook is today? If you used Instagram a year ago, um, what am I even saying? Three months ago, what Instagram was three months ago is different from what it is today. So the process of updating your products is reiteration. You want to make sure that as users are evolving, you are hearing from them and you are imputing that feedback into the product. So you release something, they tried it, they say, oh, I want more. Oh, I wish I could do this. Oh, I wish I could do that. And then you take all of that feedback, you prioritize them, select the one that is most important, ship it again, take it back to your engineering team. They work on it. And that's how products grow, right? What Juma used to be when they launched is doing what Juma is doing right now. Juma has expanded to the point where they have their entirely, like an independent payment system. They have their own delivery system. It's, so the truth is product will always grow. But as a product manager, think of the product like your baby, right? This product is your baby, right? You want to make sure that as, the, as it grows, you are taking in the feedback and using that to develop the product in, at the next stage, right? So, and then there's another point, uh, that's metrics monitoring, right? And I mean, a lot, of man, a lot of product managers don't even do this, right? And that's why we're having um, this class, just so that you don't make mistakes that people make. When you release a product, it is important that you put metrics in place that can help you measure how well the product is doing. Right, so um, metrics can be a form of um, you have this thing. I'm sure you are very familiar with this, where they ask you, um, rate this over five. What's your experience? You know, and they give you like put it five stars, and you select how well you enjoy the product. All of those triggers are to help them understand how users are engaging with that product, so that they know what next to do. Right, so metrics is critical as a product manager. You want to know how you can measure your product right and you don't even need to be good at mathematics or be a data analyst no you just need to understand the basics that okay how do you measure engagement how do you measure activation how do you measure um referral you know, all of that trigger you want to you want to be very involved in all of that um so user satisfaction user engagement reiteration so these are things that you want you you do at the point of release, right? So what you can hear, I mean, if you've been listening in the past 10 minutes, what you can hear is at each point of the product life cycle, you must always speak to users, right? You must always engage users, right? So that's cleared, right? Now, you don't ask yourself that, what kind of user data am I gathering? Right, like you know, you you are you're thinking about okay. Now I know I need to do user research. I am very well aware that you know user research is important. But how do I go about it? Now there are two types of data you can gather. Right, you have the quantitative data. You have the qualitative data. Right now, quantitative from what it's, from what it says, it means quantity, like how many. Right. And by quantity, what you can measure is um, percentages, right? You can assess that, okay, what's the percentage of people that buy food every day? What's the percentage of people that go to the office every day, right? That's quantitative data. You're trying to get uh, uh, metrics that are numeric in nature, right? So if you see things that says oh, 15 out of 20 people um, use the railway, as a, you know as a commit system so it, that's quantitative really qualitative on the other hand means getting information in, in its raw form right so quantitative is mostly in words right so when you ask a user oh how was your experience how did you feel when you use this product everything they tell you falls under the qualitative process right so qualitative data is as crucial as quantitative data, right? And then I'm going to tell you something new, right? 
at the point of you gathering quantitative data, you are also using qualitative data to measure it, to justify it, right? So for instance, you did a survey and you say, you saw that 65% prefer going shopping. They prefer shopping at the mall, right? Now, you want to go deeper. Why do I have 65% of my target audience shopping at the mall, right? That is where you throw in qualitative data. You now say, okay, hi, Maria, why do you prefer shopping at the mall? Everything Maria tells you falls under qualitative data. So you are trying to use qualitative data to justify quantitative data, to ask to really dig deeper. Uh, why am I having 15 out of 20 people choosing a shoe rather than a bag, right? So you want to hear more. So that is why as you are conducting quantitative analysis, you also want to factor in qualitative analysis, right? So is this very clear? Um, please don't your mic if you understand this so far. Yes, it's yes. Yes, I understand it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. We're going to get to a point where we're going to obviously play games, hear your opinion, you know, just juggle our memory, right? But all of these concepts are very, very important because the difference between a product manager and a project manager is the fact that a product manager focuses on the user. The user is at the center of product management, right? And that is why this particular topic is very important, right? In fact, if this is the only thing you learn, you are halfway, you know, there to, to being a very fantastic product manager, right? You want to really understand users as much as possible. Now, you, there are two basic things that you must learn also. And I mean, people use them side by side. You hear the user, you would also hear the persona, the user, the persona. Now, users are people that actually use your products. Like from the word users, people that actually are using your products. Meanwhile, personas are people who, are, who you have profiled, all right, that would actually be, that would be likely, like people who you know that there is a high chance, this, this is the segment of people that will use this product eventually right so persona is more like the guideline the user profile right that okay i want to sell this shoe right and this shoe can only be worn by women right then you want to know okay what type of what type of women will buy these shoes right then you now build the user persona so you, be, you you go deeper and say okay people within 18 to 20 years people who, women who are working, or women who have children, right? So that's that's the, the user persona, that's the user profile, right? So anytime you hear the user, anytime you get the, the persona, try and know the difference. Users, people who are using your product. Persona, people who are likely, who you, who are targeting, that would eventually become, you know, users of your product, right? Now, Note this, if the moment your target personas match your actual users, right, you can, it can be said that your user research is accurate, right? So for instance, I say, uh, I want women to use the shoe. And after releasing the shoe, men are the ones buying it, right? <laughs> then it means there's a problem, right? Or I want to sell makeup, right? And I say, okay, my persona profile, my user profile is like, oh, this makeup will be used by kids, right? Will be used by kids. And then after releasing the products, <laughs> rather than kids use this, you now have maybe men or people who are um, old, right? So you want to ensure that there is a match, right? That your persona and people who are your users, they, 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 there's, a, there's an accuracy, right? Then one other thing about personas is it must be detailed, you know, it must be well segmented, right? And you know, as a product manager, you are the one that is telling the marketing team what to do. Oh, marketing team, um, I want this product is intended to be used by so, 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 so type of people. 
your marketing team will now take that feedback and use it in their targeting. When they run Facebook ads, they run Google ads, it is that persona details they use for those um, activities, right? As a product manager, you don't want to work in an organization where you are building a product for a set, specific set of people and then your marketing team is targeting another set of people, right? So you build a mobile app for NYC core members, right? Then your marketing team is going to um, the universities to market the product. Then there's a problem because the truth is the kind of users you will get would not match the profile you have that is intended, right? And there's a lot of problem that comes from there. You problems like oh our revenue is low, or oh, why are people not buying this, or why are people not engaging with our product, right? So it means that you must ensure that the personas and users have some sort of there must be connection between both right so we'll go deeper later in, in the subsequent sl slides right so personal analysis helps you factor your products into the lifestyle of the intended user right and i'll give you an example um how many of you have heard of peloton p-e-l-o-t-u-t-o-n uh put it in chats if you if you've heard of this before just type it, type it in the chats. Have you heard of Peloton before? Type it in the chats. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Oh, awesome. All right. So yeah. put it in put it in the chat. Uh, how many of you, how many of you have heard of Peloton before? Okay, I can see you've not heard of it. No. Okay. Who else? I, I need more answers. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thanks for that feedback. Right. So Peloton is a platform that it's a, it's a fitness platform, right? And what they do is they actually sell fitness equipment, but they sell it in, in using the subscription model, right? And um, the difference between Peloton and your regular uh, by the road gym or whatever is that Peloton infuses the use of digital instructors, right? People who would teach you virtually, right? So um, you want to do aerobics now, you want to, um, to you know, use a treadmill, right? Right? And you don't want to go to the gym. Right. By when once you subscribe to Peloton services, right, and you get their equipment, you get access to a virtual instructor who is able to train you, you know, live. Now, this product became very successful, um, especially during the COVID era, right? And you ask yourself, why, why Peloton? Why I mean it's it's a unicorn, right? And you're you're asking, why did this product gain so much traction? The answer is very, very simple. Peloton targeted the right users. Peloton targeted the right users. Because you think about it, there's COVID. People can't go to the gym. You have people who are working from home. You also have people who are, who are sitting in front of their laptops all day. And, you know, you have issues of health. Like, oh, I, I, I just, I, I'm not happy about myself. I'm just in indoor all day, right? All of those factors allowed the product to thrive, right? So Peloton listens to users. They understood that the kind of people we have, right, are people who are mostly at home, but they also want to be fit, right? And they're in the, taking that feedback, they're now able to build a system, a product that answers all of that question, right? So this is a very, very good example of products that understand users, products that conducted proper user research, right? So, and I did a quadrant here, right? Um, this quadrant is very, very important when it comes to analyzing everything under user research. Um, I think someone is not muted. Uh, um, if, you're not speaking, if you're not speaking, you can still mute it. All right. Think, uh, 
Okay. Awesome. All right. So we have this. We have this table that serves as a guide uh, for you as a product manager, right? So you know we talked about we've established who the user is. We have also established who personas are, right? Now let's merge them. Let's put them side by side and think about what like what you as a product manager would do, right? Now, in a case of where your personas and your users, just a second, when your personas and your users match, right? I said that's accurate, right? So that's perfect. Now, when your personas, right, are not like they are not users of your platform, right? You have to check that um, people who are using your products are not the people you intended, right? They are not your personas. What you want to do as a product manager is you want to assess it. You want to measure two things. The first one is, are we doing proper marketing, right? Am I, are we sure our marketing is done properly? You also ask your question of, are we also sure we are building the right product, right? So the moment your personas are not users of your, your platform, then you want to check two things, marketing and product. Now, on the second stage, when non-personas are users, right, people who are not your personas are users, you also want to see if there are market opportunities there, right? That, oh, is, it, is there a chance that I can build a product that will serve this audience? Right. Do we need to tweak something? Is there something we are not seeing? Right. Is there a consumer segment we need to pay attention to? Right. So that's that's you know what this quadrant will help you do. You know, you want to measure these two things, you want to put them side by side, right? And the moment, obviously, when people who are not your personas are not your users, then you know that yes, you are doing the right thing because you don't want to you are not building for people who will not use it, right? So this quadrant is perfect when it comes to analyzing users and the personas, right? So let's go to the next stage. So how many of you have heard of uh, demographics? Um, if you've heard of demographics, I put it in the chat. Um, demographics, psychometrics, the behavior, just put it in the chat. Have you heard of this before? OK. You have. Awesome, 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 right? So this is where this falls, right? While you're profiling your users, you know, I told you that there's a thing called profiling and that's your persona, right? Now, there are three things you want to pay attention to, three very, three critical things, right? So the first is demographics. And demography, you have a lot of things that, you know, you are looking at when you are looking at demography, you are looking at their age, you are looking at social class, you are looking at their location, you are looking at their marital status, you are looking at gender, you are looking at culture, right? And the real question you are asking is, like, who are these people? Who, you know, you want to actually know how these people qualify to become your persona, right? So, demographics answers the question of who they are, right? So. You check their age, you check their social class, you check where they live, you check their status, check their gender, check their culture, right? All of this play out in determining if your product will succeed or fail. If your product is going to succeed or if it's going to fail, it, you, it is based on all of these factors, right? The demography of the user, the psychometrics of the user, and the behavior of the user, right? The second thing you want to think about is how they act, right? So how do these people act that qualifies them to be your target personas, right? So for instance, um, maybe this particular target group often go to church on Sundays by 5.30, or they go to the gym by 6 o'clock every day, or they, are, they, are, they, they, they constantly use um, Netflix at a particular time, right? So that's habits, right? You want to watch that behavior. You want to know that the product you are building is actually in sync with the user's behavior, right? 
The third thing, psychometrics, right? And psychometric answers the question of why they act in the way they do, right? That qualifies them as your target persona, right? So, for instance, you found out that the behavior of the user is they like to go to the gym every day. On that psychometrics, you now go deeper to say, okay, these guys go to the gym every day because they are scared of living an unhealthy life, right? So that being scared of living an unhealthy life is the mindset. Why? Like, why are they doing this? Why? Why do they go to church every Sunday? Why do Why do people use crypto? Right? Oh, okay. Twenty percent of people within twenty-five years and thirty years buy crypto. That's behavior, right? That's telling you the behavior. But in your psychometrics, you're not going deeper to say, okay, why would they choose to buy crypto? Oh, you now find out that, oh, because they want to send money in, in a very seamless manner or because they, they want to be able to transact without paying fees, right? So psychometrics tells you their mindsets. Why do you do what you do, right? Behavior. Habits. Behavior tells you about habits. I do this every day. I go to work every day. I I always switch off my phone at 2 p.m. every day, right? That's behavior. So you want to measure, you want to understand user behavior critically. Then you now go deeper to check the, the why. Why are they doing those things, right? So demographics, behavior, and psychometrics. So um, let's do a brain test, right? Let's, let's have people who can... Um, just jog, just give me in your own words in five seconds what does demographics mean to you what does behavior mean to you what does psychometrics mean to you and oh maybe let's even take this a notch higher right let's take this a notch higher let's let's even assess um you as a person right everybody on this call fits into a persona right so let's look at you as an individual right and i'll be able to tell you the reason why um this particular program program caught your attention everybody on this call right now uh, right the reason why you're taking this course is because what this course is offering you matched your user persona right we have women here who are young who want to transition who all of those factors i, I, could, I could see the behavioral pa patterns in all of this i could see your psychometrics a lot of you want to be able to get better jobs you want to get bet paid better you want to be part of the revolution, you know, you want to be able to build the future products that we'll use. All of this, and that is why Web3 is a successful platform, is a successful project, because they factored in all of these pointers, right? They know that the demography of people that will take this course will be people during 20 and probably 35, right? Right? They did not build these products for people who are 18 years or, or 15 years, right? Of course, there are products that can do that, but the persona for Web3 you will be able to see that people who are using, who are taking this course at the moment, are people who, that like, who are the profile, people who are, they had profiled, right? There is a bridge, there's a match, there's an accuracy, right? So let's let's go deeper, let's make this interesting, right? Um, please, uh, let's have one person who can uh, unmute our mic. I'll ask you a couple of questions and then we're going to bring out some results. Um, Let's have someone. So if you're listening, please one person unmute we'll your mic. Let's let's have a chat. Hello. Hi. Um anybody? okay. So this is Fumilayo, I guess, right? Yes, it is. Okay. So hi Fumilayo. So um first of all, um let's start from your demographics. What's your age range? Give me an idea of your age. Um, 27 to 30. Okay, beautiful. Um, what's your location? Around where do you stay? Uh, Lagos. All right. Roger. So, all right, are you married? No. Okay. Right. And so I've got your demographics, right? Then let me ask, let me go deeper. Let me know. Let me, I want to build a product that fits into your lifestyle. And I want it to work with a lot of people on this call because everybody in this, on this call fits into this um, 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 data points that we have captured. So what do you do every day? Walk me through when you, in your daily life, can you walk me through uh, what you do from the moment you wake up in the morning till when you go to bed? 
okay when i wake up in the morning i love to have tea then okay. i prepare for the office because i'm an entrepreneur so and i like to attend to my clients and you know do job do my work basically throughout the day then okay i get breakfast around 11 12 ish every day then do lunch by let's say three to four and that's it for the day then i come home i take a shower i relax i sleep physically i prepare for the next day so that's my routine for mondays to fridays yes awesome awesome and if i would ask you um the food do you what kind of food do you eat? Do you order your food or do, are they all made? Uh, it's a mix of both. Depends on the schedule that I have. Awesome. Awesome. Right. So I, I can tell one reason why a food um, food delivery platform or a platform that enables people to order food online, you are going to be their perfect customer based on what you've just told me. I can hear that you're an entrepreneur. You're single, you're working, you live in Lagos. Lagos is very busy, Lagos is rough. You are young, you are between yeah. 20 and 35, right? You are your prime. And I can see that from your schedule, when you wake up in the morning, you are always up to something. You're always doing something at each point, right? Correct. From, from yeah. what you've told me, yes. So from what you've told me, I have all the data points I need if I want to build a food delivery product. If I also want to build a, uh, what do you call this now? Um, so for instance, I know you go to the salon, right? And I'm very sure your schedule might be very busy. I could build a mobile app that allows you to um, book your time slots when you're going to the salon, right? So, because I know that you don't want to enter, like you don't want to go there and you find tons of people and you are, you have to wait, right? So exactly. I, I definitely know that that kind of product is gonna work for you. Then I also know that you are going to love to con collaborate virtually. I'm, I'm very sure that you use either Instagram or TikTok or WhatsApp. I'm sure either of these three apps are your go-to platforms daily. Am I correct? Correct. I use them for businesses also. So perfect. You see, as a product manager, that's that's the science of it. That's the science of it. Your product must match your user persona. You must know all of the reasons why users will download your app or sign up to your platform you want to make sure it fits into their lifestyle right and then i can assure you that there are a lot of formulas on this call right so if i have about 40 formulas people who have like formulas on this call i know that my mobile app is going to thrive because i can see volume i can see that i can i can get traction right from that data right so that's how you think as a product manager you know that's that's the interesting thing about product management you you are you're debugging a lot of things you are asking questions you're asking why you're going deeper trying to define things you know and that's just interesting because you forget the fact that you have multi-billion dollar businesses today a lot of people still need your help they need people who can help them understand their users better i will show you some slides in this presentation that even tells you why some businesses have failed as a result of not matching up with um, their user profile, right? Um, the next slide you're seeing is why with profile users, right? Uh, so there are three things, there are three critical things that form the basis of profiling your personas, right? The first one is people who have the capacity to use the product, right? I want to see that, okay, from what from Laya shared with me, I can see she has the capacity. She's, she's an entrepreneur, chances are she's at least earning above 100,000 per month you know, from my business, right? I know that, okay, she can afford to pay 1,000 Naira or 1,500 Naira for, um, subs to subscribe to um, a saloon mobile app because I know she can afford it, right? So you want to ensure that you, you focus on the capacity that, oh, do they have what it takes in terms of income, right? Then in terms of social class, right? I know that a food delivery app will not work in a place like Kaduna, you wouldn't work in a place like Casina because the social status there are not people who are conformed with you know digital lifestyle, right? So you think about capacity. The next thing you think about is people who have the need to use the product, right? 
And I just remembered something. What this class is also doing to you is that, and I think I also said it yesterday, is that this class is not just about product management. It's, it's like you're going through an MBA course. You're learning how to be a better business person, how to be a better entrepreneur, because that's essentially the mindset. That's the, that's the methodology of product management. It helps you become a better manager of things and how it helps you get value, right? Because you're thinking of getting, making more money from this. You want to, um, you want to release products that, you know, that would thrive, right? So all of these things we are learning in user research, design thinking, PR, all of that, com you know, it comes together, right? So the second thing I said is people who have the need to use your product. So you, your profiling is going to help you answer those questions. Then it also helps you to answer people who have the interests, right? People who are interested in using your product, right? Because all of those signals, the psycho psychographic signals, demographic signals, they all give you pointer that, okay, this I now have reasons to go ahead, right? I can now take this product to the next level. I can now start working on my wireframe because I now know who I am building for, right? Now, um, you would have heard user stories uh, before now. I'm sure you're very, very familiar with user stories. You know, as a product manager, user stories, what, um, when you hear product requirement documents, your product requirement document is where you put together your user stories, right? Um, there's going to be a few, there's a module um, in subsequent weeks that will answer all of the questions on PRD and all of that. But I'm just giving you a sample of the user story and I want to tell you how um, validating users would, you know, it helps you in getting like getting data that you need. So the first thing is when you're writing your user story, you start with the four, right? For people within the age of 20 and 30 who live in Lagos, who have the need to shop online. Awaba is a web-based platform or a mobile-based platform that allows users to do XYZ, probably to order food online, right? So unlike Jumia Foods, our product is unique because it would allow it to use artificial intelligence or it will use a decentralized approach for ordering the foods so that's a user story everything i've just said can fit into that user story that you are about to create as a product manager so this template is universal right any feature you're building any products you're building you want to use this template right you start with the four which is at the top here for people who X, Y, Z, for people who live in Lagos, who are within 20 and 30. So that's demography. It has, has everything we've just talked about. Then who have blah, 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 right? So when you say who have, then you, you, talk, you talk about the need. That, okay, they need this. They need to go to the market or they need to um, get food at the quickest possible time. Then you move to your solution and say, okay, my solution is, is it web-based? Is it mobile-based? Is it USSD? Right, so all of that is what goes into your user stories, you know. And you say this product allows users to save towards X, Y, Z, or it allows them to do the capability of your product. This is where you you impute it. Then you also now go deeper to say why your product is unique, right? Now the good thing about this is that after you have built your user story, after you have composed your user story right you want to gather all of the validations you need right you want to now ensure that i am not wrong right so at the right hand side you can see all of the assumptions so the assumptions we have made right now is our users are people who will do who are within the age range we have specified there are people who have the need that we have also specified and that our users are interested in solving that need using a web-based or a mobile-based platform now this is why I had to put this in. You can create a solution, perfect solution, right? Very good solution. And realize that the users actually would prefer it is in form of a USSD. Imagine you build a mobile app for something they would have preferred to be a USSD platform. Chances are the product is going to fail, right? So your user stories helps you, testing your user stories helps you in ensuring that the product is going to succeed, right? So you can take it from the top again. 
we test the demography, we test the need, we test the platform that is the solution is supposed to be on. We also will test if they will prefer our platform beyond like above all the other competitors or all the alternatives that we have. Right. So I want to create a mobile app that helps people in reading books, reading books online. Am I I need to validate that the user prefers using my mobile app to going to the library, right? Because the truth is people read books normally. They go to the library to read books. I need to validate how my products would be preferred. Why would they choose what I am building to what they normally do right now, right? So all of these are answered in the process of doing user research, right? Because once one of these factors fail, right? If one of these things, one of your assumption is wrong, it's like you've wasted money, right? It's like the business have wasted money, literally. Once you have one part of this wrong or not properly validated, there's going to be a problem, right? Let me repeat that. You must test that the, the demography is accurate, the customers are within the demography you, you, you intend to build for. You must test the need, right? That they need that product. You must test that the platform you are using, that, oh, okay, this is going to be using Web3 uh, elements. These are some of the things you are infusing, or these are some of the APIs you are strapping together. You must test to be sure that that is better than any other thing you would have done, right? Then you also want to test, finally, that they will choose you, they will choose what you have above all other options due to X, Y, Z. Maybe you are using AI as the search parameter or you're using a face recognition platform at the point of sign up so you must ensure that you get answers from users before you move to the next stage of development right so please let me know at this point do you understand if you have questions please let me know uh you can unmute your mic so if you perfectly understand please please unmute your mic let me hear your opinion and then if i can go let me know if i can go ahead Um, hi, good evening. Yes, go ahead. Please, I, I have a question. I understand everything, but my question is about creating a user story. Okay. And I'm just wondering how, um, for an instance where you're not the founder or like the product is not yours, how do you like create a story that tells the mind of the person that actually wants to create that product? Okay, um, repeat your question again. Okay, I was just um, concerned when you're creating a user story, mm -hmm. because from, from the things that you mentioned, you need to have a grasp of what the product wants to do. Mm -hmm. So like in, in um, an instance where you're not the owner of the product, like you're okay. just a product manager. Okay. Sorry for the background noise. So like how do you um, tell a very good story that captures the mind of the owner of the products basically awesome awesome all right so a lot of times right you would find yourself working in, a, in an organization that already has a product right now capturing that data points so that there, there are cases where you have an existing user story you know, if they hired a product manager previously, there are chances you would have documentation that answers that. But when that is not existing, right, you want to write your user story objectively, logically. You are not considering what they have done. You are considering what it is supposed to be, right? So you have to ignore the fact that, oh, okay, they built, so for instance, they built a mobile app that helps people with, um, cooking online, right? Making food online or something, right? Your user story must not assume that, oh, that is what this is supposed to do or this is what users want. You must assess it from an objective angle, right? And you must test each of those assumptions, right? You must test each of them that, okay, how are we sure that they would not prefer a web-based platform, right? So, and the only way you test is obviously you through all of this, um, 
methodologies that's user research questionnaires user interviews consumer trends you know all of that are all the tools you can use in 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 validating your data right so write your user stories objectively test your user stories from the data you gather from users don't think of what the founder is telling you what the ceo is telling you or what the employees are telling you no you want to listen to users first you want to hear their opinion and you don't assume that oh because the product is already in the market then that's the best way it can be what about if what you're about to do is going to save them the hassle probably your your, your analysis is not able to it's going to help them renovate their products you know or change the direction of their product right so that's that's the part of user stories but essentially you must write your user stories before you develop anything right user stories are at the beginning stage of development right it is after you have validated your user stories as a product manager that you can now tell your ui ux designer to design the wireframe like, okay now this is going to work let us have a physical representation let us do a prototype right so i hope that answers your question yes it does thank you very much awesome do we have any other questions so i think i can proceed right now this is a very important part how to conduct user interviews right because you know we talked about qualitative data right and when you're doing customer interviews you want to you're engaging the user directly right now the first thing which is the rule of thumb is you want to allow the users express themselves freely you don't want to give them tips that will mislead them right so for instance i'm working on a product that allows people to um, know how to cook rice or know how to eat rice or whatever right and then within my interview i call you that oh hi from Lyo. um please tell me you like rice right obviously from is going to tell me yes now that information from is giving to me is redundant because chances are, what about if she likes beans? What about if she likes spaghetti? Right? So you you or what about if she doesn't like anything at all? What about if she prefers something else? Right? So you want to make sure that when you are doing your user interview, you don't mislead your user. You get the raw, you get the raw information that you need, right? Like when I was engaging from Lyra during the call right i asked her to walk me through her daily life right i didn't tell her that oh would you use a mobile app that helps you to make your hair or would you you know do you get what i mean i i wanted to first understand what it like a pain point a journey the user journey what she does daily right because it is from that i'm able to gather all the points i need to you know build a better product Right. So during when you're talking to users, you don't you don't mislead them. You don't give them all of the answers. Allow them to lead you. Allow them to talk about the issues and then you follow those issues from what they say, from their experiences with other products. You, you will now learn like, oh, OK, I didn't see this before. Oh, I think we are targeting the wrong problem. I think users would actually prefer a platform that does something different or entirely new. Right. So. That is why we had to teach this right as a product manager your user interview must be flawless you must get the right information not just getting information no you must get the right information from users right right so and then how do you source for users how do you get these people right so there are lots of factors a lot of uh, places right code calls communities you can go on communities there are different slack communities where you can target users right you can if you're an organization that has newsletters you can share it on your newsletters you can share it on social media right you can um, there are a lot of other platforms where you can distribute your invitation for user interview or your questionnaires or your surveys right all of that you know as a product manager you want to be able to know how to do those things right now this is interesting and this is going to be very very interactive right so at this point i want you to talk to me like i want us to learn deeper like i want us to 
absorb this better. Now, if you look at your screen, right, you're going to see two mobile devices. You have the BlackBerry and you have the Android, right? These are two products, right? Um, I would like someone to tell me, right? BlackBerry used to be the iPhones about 10 years ago, right? Then MTN, Airtel, they even had a special package for BlackBerry. If you're a BlackBerry user, the, I mean, you were, you were just treated specially. Every, in fact, it was the phone of, it was the talk of the town, actually, right? And right now, I can tell you that if you check 100 people, what am I even saying? A thousand people, you will not find one person using a BlackBerry device, right? Who can, you know, just share with me, why do you think this, this is so? Why did we have the switch? You know, in your own words, you know, and I would really love to hear a lot of your interesting um, side of the story. So please unmute your mics. Tell me, why did the BlackBerry, why did, why do we have um, a different type of device now than the BlackBerry? Um, I think black, Blackberries are not common anymore because things have evolved. User needs have evolved. Technology has evolved. I personally wouldn't get the BlackBerry now because Blackberries can't even fulfill the needs I have that a phone should provide for me. Did you, did you use a BlackBerry? No, I never did actually, but I used to see it around. Oh, nice, nice. All right. Hello. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Yes. yes. Um, I think one of the unique features for BlackBerry then that really made it, you know, popular was the fact that we had BlackBerry messengers and mm -hmm. it was unique because there was a pin assigned to everybody. So you could easily share your pin with someone else and you know they add you, then you chat. For me, I think um the I think the evolution of WhatsApp changed that and the fact that at the point blackberry actually was it sold or released that feature that was unique to their phones to the android system so i think that actually broke the whole trend of blackberry then. awesome awesome thank you for that thank you for that did you use a blackberry at any point yes it, it was the talk of town then <laughs> if you don't use this you are not you are not among <laughs> All right, awesome. Thank you for that. Let's hear more opinions. Who can tell us why we don't have blackberries today? Um, I think it's because um, blackberry refused to evolve their market. Um, initially, when blackberry started, I think he, it was made to really cater to the corporate world in a sense. And what Apple and Android did, they were able to meet more user needs. And at that time, I feel like BlackBerry could have, you know, had sense and tried to evolve with this new technology. But they decided to stick with what they were doing and it didn't work for them. And by the time that they had figured out that, okay, user needs has changed, technology has evolved, it was too late. <laughs> Awesome, awesome, right? Um, you also remember that user behavior changed in the sense that people were tired of using keypads, right? How would you want to send a message? And you have to, I even, like looking at this right now, I'm just surprised how people were able to magically send a message. And to think of it, in those days, people send like, in five seconds, someone has sent like five, 10 messages, as small as these keypads you know, used to be, right? I mean, I, I know at some point you would type to the point where you're <laughs> you begin to feel pains in, in your, in your, in your you think like it's you, you could tell that user behavior evol evolved right demographics change people had more money people could afford to to um um actually migrate that okay then android when android came it was more like oh is it affordable can i know iphone used to have this interface but iphone was not affordable at that time but the moment android came made it gave us the interface we needed, gave us the price points that we needed, gave us the behavioral pattern that matched our preferences, matched our habits. People wanted to chat um, without me having to go through 
I have to copy your pin, I have to paste it here, and all of that, right? All of that factor combined, right, led to the collapse of BlackBerry. Now, if you were a product manager at BlackBerry at that time, chances are that if you were listening to users, they had an opportunity to actually save the day, right? Because everybody knew BlackBerry. They had the highest market share. They were making billions of dollars year on year, right? They had the opportunity to do whatever they want to do at that time. But the truth is, users will always evolve. And the only way you can match up with users is by consistently doing user research. User research will help you to know when your product is becoming latent, if it is becoming unusable, if it's becoming, if it's not matching their social class, right? User research gives you all of that information. So it helps you to avert that disaster, right? And that is why if you see nowadays, when, and a lot of you can relate, when Clubhouse was released and Clubhouse was, get, was getting traction and Twitter, Facebook realized that, ah, it seems this Clubhouse is going to get the highest market share for social media uh, apps. Guess what they did? Now you have Twitter spaces, right? Yeah, people are thinking it's competition, right? As a product manager, you know, you must always know that users are evolving, right? Twitter did not have a, a bad business model. Twitter was working fine before now. But because there is a change in user behavior, people wanted to talk rather than chat. They wanted to, you know, meet new people randomly, right? And Clubhouse figured it out, did it, and started to make waves. Before you knew it, Twitter knew that it's either sink or swim. We either evolve or we die. And you know, so as a product manager, you want to be thinking like that. You want to be thinking, what am I missing out on, right? You had Snapchat at the time. Snapchat too had a very good run, you know, making waves. All of the filters was just so interesting. It was uh, people, young people were attracted. Instagram realized this and said, oh, it seems we're probably going to lose our market share to these guys. Guess what they did? They came up with Instagram Reels. Right, so it's competition. When TikTok came, right, when we had TikTok, Facebook also responded. They tried to create a system that can work like TikTok. But for the fact that TikTok was able to hack the system, they 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 knew the like TikTok understood who their perfect user is. They know what they want. They don't, I mean, I want to make a video. I don't need to be a video editor. I don't need to learn how to. I don't need to take a course on how to edit a video, I, I just want to make dope videos. And then you give me a mobile app that can do this easily, right? So, and that's why you see TikTok making waves, right? Because they knew the segment of people that will use it. They knew that the time was right. You have a lot of musicians releasing songs and they want these songs to go viral. So they created challenges that would match what these users would love. Once you open your TikTok, if you notice, the first thing you see is a video. They don't even show you a dashboard. Isn't that funny? They don't even show you a dashboard. They show, the first thing you see when you open TikTok is a video because they know that once they can keep you, once they can get you stuck from the first 15 seconds, you would use that product for the next one hour, right? And that's why it's addictive, right? That's why people use it over and over again because they cracked the system. They understood the, the, the fundamentals of user research. They knew that if you want to build a multi-billion dollar product you know, or you want to have a business idea that will go global you must understand why users will use it you must understand the behavior of the users you must understand the psychometrics of the user right and all of this will help you edge out your competition so if a facebook is coming tomorrow and they're trying to duplicate what you're doing chance if you do your work right you do your assignments right as a product manager you would still survive because you'll be able to create new features create new updates that would still keep you in the market, right? How many of you absolutely agree with what I've just said? Please type it in the chat. Let, let, let me hear your opinion. Do you, agree, do you agree to what I've just said? Awesome. Awesome. Awesome, right? Awesome. Thanks for your opinion. So it's the same thing for this as well. We used to have the yellow taxis then. But today we have Uber, we have Taxify, 
right? So who can tell us why did we why 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 is there a change? Why like people used to use taxis normally and it was working, right? Why is there a paradigm shift? Why do we have people um, downloading apps um, using ride alien platforms? What what made this work? Like what are the factors that made Uber work or Taxify work? Yeah, so please omit your mic and share and, um, and talk to us. Um, can I go? Yes, please go. I remember um we taxis like you had to leave your house and then you had to be under the sun or whether it was under the rain and wait until maybe you were lucky to see a taxi or maybe go to their garage or something. But with Uber, you can just order it from your house. You can even plan your timing. I know that oh, I know that the car will be here within the next five, ten minutes. You can plan your time and so people wanted to order, um, I, I, and also the issue of security as well. With with the yellow taxes, we really there was, I don't think there was really an organization governing them. But like with Uber and Co, you feel like okay, this driver is under, um, is under an organization that so, um, it is more secure security wise. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Let's hear. Okay. Oh, can I do the suggestion? Okay. Um, can I? Can I yes, speak? Yes. Let's have one person and the others will go. It is actually convenient and is cashless. You can easily make transfer for payments and stuff. You you mustn't have money cash to give them. Mm. Okay. Very okay, good. So, um, for tax and the I think right, the fact that um you see some of the Uber they are too like um in Portacot, where I am, you can go for, we use both here. You can decide to use the executive one. You see two cars. Say you have um, a meeting to attend. You don't want pulling up uh, in a yellow taxi, telling everyone that, ah, I didn't drive myself to this place. I'm coming from this yellow taxi. But with both and Uber, you can get executive clean vehicles. The ACs, they are working. When you come out, you come out like paying. <laughs> Always cut for <laughs> awesome. Um, if okay, if so, I think um, for me, what stood out okay. is that uh, okay, for sorry. Yellow taxis, uh, 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 yeah, the comfort is a thing, the convenience is also a thing. But another thing that stood out for me was I mean, you just keep the whole negotiation part. Like, normally you go out and then you hail a taxi and then you argue, is it 1000, is it 150? But with Uber, you just know how much you're going to pay. Like the, the meter is waiting for you. And so you just know, okay, at the end of this trip, I'm expected to pay this amount of money. And not um, let's not start dragging you're going to pay this amount and you're not giving my change and you're giving my change and the likes of it. Mm, awesome, beautiful. Thanks for that feedback. Let's have one more person. Um from my own side, I think the Uber is actually better because of security purposes. I mean when you book a ride, you can always share your ride with your friend and family or maybe wherever you're going to or whoever you're going to meet, you can share those rides with them. But then when you're using like a yellow taxi, you can't share your rides with people that are close to you for security purposes. It's not possible. You're just going. I mean, the driver can always take it to else and you can't start making calls or anything. But then when you share your rides, people can actually say like, oh, this person is pulling on that, which has this person going through. And you also, you can actually see it um, from the map there where the person is pulling and all that. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Can, can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Did, awesome. Okay. I was going to say an answer, but it's fine. Okay. Okay. Five seconds. Tell us. Five seconds. Tell us. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I think evolved from the need to have um designated drivers like if we're thinking worldwide yeah, like um uber started in like other countries before it came to nigeria and like just mm -hmm. need to have like pre-booked riders for from coming to the airport from coming out of the club it was more difficult to work with you know taxis and i feel like that's where the innovation came from beautiful beautiful a round of applause to everybody. I really enjoyed what you've shared. Now, let's break it down. Let's break it down. Why did Uber succeed? Why is Taxify succeeding till today? First of all, we have to remember that the fact that now everybody has 
access to a mobile device, a smartphone. Hope you know that if we were in the age of the BlackBerry, right, where you could not just download a mobile app or where maybe when we had Nokia at that time, you know, or the Java apps at that time, chances are Uber would not survive, right? The fact that there is a technology trigger, right, the fact that users have access to mobile devices, they can afford all of those demographic triggers is the first thing that guarantees their success. Now, let's go to the behavior. People wanted to go for meetings. Someone talked about meetings. Someone talked about coming from the airport. These are user behaviors, things they do every day, right? And Uber was able to build a product that fit into all of those scenarios. Now, you as a product manager, when you are building your product or when you are assessing a product, you must measure each of the, you must assess how your product fits into the people you are building for. Does it match their current behavior? Can they afford it? Does it match their demography, right? Does it also match um, their psychometric? So if Uber had launched, if Uber had also launched in um, somewhere else, say for instance, um, in maybe, uh, let me give an example now, maybe Gombe or Bauchi, right? Chances are they will not even get traction. And why is that? People in Bauchi are not tech savvy. A lot of people might not have smartphones, right? How many people have reasons to commute long distance? You know, you have all of those factors that would are like lead to the failure of the product. So you also want to make sure that you are building a product that will not fail. And the only way you can guarantee that is by doing proper user research, right? Proper user research. Now, this is the same case for Coca-Cola, right? We used to have Coca-Cola. I mean, it tastes great. Like, everybody loves Coca-Cola, right? And if you notice, there's a new trend now with most of these soft drinks. They now tell you things like, oh, zero sugar, no additives, 100% natural, 100%. You know, I'm sure you must have seen that a lot in you know a lot of these drinks that you you know you have. Who can tell us why this is happening, right? Like, why do you think why do you think this is the scenario today? Like, based on the people who drink, who take these products, right? What scenarios played out? Why is Coca-Cola evolving? Why are all of these companies evolving? You know, and why are they having? Why do we have Coca-Cola zero sugar as a product? Who can tell okay, us? So, um, can I go? Yes, yes. Um, I think it's because um, right now, like a lot of people have evolved so much where people are now like very health conscious. People mm -hmm. are concerned about, you know, their health, eating right. You know, they still want to be able to enjoy the things that, you know, make them happy. Mm -hmm. Or and also not have to bother about this thing. Is it bad for my health? Am I going to grow fat? You know, mm -hmm. and all of all those things. So I think this is uh, one reason why you know many of all these companies are now beginning to factor in that thing because I mean, their their intended audience right now are mostly you know those people who want to enjoy still enjoy their products, but yet they still want to be healthy. They want to keep fit and the likes of it. Beautiful, beautiful. I like that. Uh, very good. So I mean listen to users every time because user needs evolve it user coca-cola did not know there was a problem 10 years ago right because people did not care but nowadays people are thinking about oh they're checking their weights they're checking their blood sugar people are going to the gym and their gym instructor is telling you that wait you mean you are doing this and you're still taking a bottle of coke do you want to die you know so all of that play like all of that information helped the team at coca-cola to know that oh if we want to still be in this market, we must build a product that matches what users want or what they, you know, what, what what fits into their lifestyle, right? And that's your job as a product manager, right? You as a product manager, and I believe everybody on this call, right? It is my belief that from what you've learned today, in any organization you find yourself, you will not be part of a field product. You will not work on a field product because all of this information you have will help you to avert all of those problems. A lot of businesses have money, millions, billions, right? And they don't have information. Now, this is the information you have gotten, right? And that is why 
people are requesting for product managers today because they know that you are in the best position to constantly evolve the product. They know that users change their tastes from time to time. And the only way you can match it is by consistently hearing from them, right? So that's why in my own organization, every week, we try to listen to user. We, we listen to user every day, every day. We do interviews, not for anything, just to be sure that we are still in touch with reality. We want to be sure that what we have is still as relevant as it used to be when we released the product, right? So with that being said, right, um, I think I, I'd like to hear you. How how did you enjoy this class? Did you what what did you learn from this class? Uh, Please share from what we've spoke, like talk, we've been on this call for like an hour, 30 minutes. Who can tell us one very critical thing you learned that you did not know this before, like you did not know this existed before? Yeah, please unmute your mic and let's hear you. Okay, what resonated to me the most in this class is what we just actually finished discussing about how the PM has to be very alert to changes in user needs and what, what users didn't want before that they want now, or what you used to provide before that they don't need anymore. If you don't move, if your product does not move with the change, you are going to lose out a lot and you might end up failing out. And now that we've discussed this, I'm already thinking of products that I know that they are offering a lot of features that they, they are not even needed. And maybe the, I'm just, I'm just already thinking about products that they're already looking like what we are discussing right now. And I'm thinking if they don't work on that, they might have problems in the future. Then yes. the other thing we did about user personas, about having user personas matching your actual users or not matching actual users, that's actually a new thing for me too. Thank you oh, very, very much. Good. Very good, very good. Nice one. Let's hear more people. I'll mute your mic and go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so um, one thing that I learned is when you mentioned that we should always put metrics in place for monitoring growth. So um, I've usually noticed on some apps where they'll just bring up that five-star thing and ask you to rate them. And I'm always like, why are these ones stressing me and all that? <laughs> but now, now that you're explaining like how all these things actually help them, and I now understand better that this is actually for them to measure their growth and see how they're performing. Basically. All right, beautiful, beautiful. So another thing you would do, which is, although it's not part of your assignment, but I think one thing you also want to start learning is how do I measure uh, user satisfaction? What are the types of um, user research you can conduct? We've mentioned user interviews, we've mentioned um, surveys. You know, you want to start to try your hands around it. You want to start, I mean, a lot of you who especially want to get jobs, right? You want to um, work on hypothetical products, right? So you're applying to a, an organization and you, you really need this job, right? As a product manager, because you know it's going to be the next level for you. You don't need to wait till the interview day. You can start working on the user profile, assess it. These products, what problems are they facing? Do a proper, do design thinking. Prepare it in a PDF file. Go on LinkedIn, share it with the CDO, share it with your HR. You know, that's, that's, what, that's what you need to do. Think outside the box, right? You've learned how to solve problems. You've learned how to build a better product. You've learned how products should um, should not be latent. It should not be, it should always be evolving, right? Look at the things you have today. Businesses that are existing today, web three platforms, web three projects that are existing today that you want to, go, you want to do an analysis of their framework send it to the organization, hear their opinion. I mean, what who, what who says you can't get, you can't land a job within one week from what you've learned, right? Who says you can't get an internship position in the next two weeks from this? Because this is knowledge. This is, everybody wants someone who can solve their problems, right? And this is, as a product manager, you're a problem solver by default, right? Your default mode as a product manager is being a, pro a problem solver. And that's why I want to encourage everyone to, Take it seriously. Like, pay very close attention to this. You know, absorb it. Don't think anything is difficult. There is nothing difficult. I learned product management under a year. I mean, I didn't study this in school. 
a lot of people, a lot of you on this call probably didn't do anything relating to business in school, right? People learn it in a month. So the truth is, and it changed my life, right? I mean, for the rest of my life, on my trajectory is um it's all speaking. All right. So the truth is, the trajectory of my my life right now is as a result of what I learned in maybe three months or four months, right? So open up your mind. Try to um oh, please mute yourself if you're not speaking, uh, so that you don't interrupt. All right. So as I'm, as I was saying, open up your mind, absorb the information that is being passed, ask questions. Um, I would I'll put my I think I'll put my number on the chat, right? So if you have questions, feel free to DM me or Slack or via WhatsApp. You know, if you need resources, let me know. I'm always ready to help. We actually want you to take advantage of the platform where we ladies are giving you. Uh, let's... Someone is not muted. Uh, it's so loud. Okay. All right, so so take advantage of the knowledge you've gotten, right, and implement it. I, to be honest, I learned this and it changed my life, and I'm very confident it's going to change your own life too. And I think Web3 Lead is a very good job putting this together, right? So, you know, I really wish all of you the best. I think uh, you would always get information on Slack or on your Notion or via email on what next and all of that so but then your assignments that reminds me based on what was given yesterday you know we talked about um, you um working on a web3 project right having a design like using design thinking in creating like a better framework right so in that same document do user research right try and see information you can get either from consumer trends from metrics you see on the internet or people you speak to just add it to your submission right so user research design thinking let it be based on that web three products you have chosen right so and then i, I think the date of submission will be communicated as well right if you need help please always let me know and um attempt it really no matter how if you don't even if you don't know where to start just start at any point attempt it from the first paragraph you will have an idea of what you should put in the second paragraph any template you give me works for me i just want to see how you think i want to see how you like your approach to program management and then we would later in the weekend i think there's going to be a review session where we would now review what you have submitted so um i really really wish everyone the best of luck so do we have anyone that has questions? So now we can take any questions that you have. Please feel free. Questions. I can see some hands raised. Uh, you can ask your questions. If you, you can omit yourself and ask questions. Or if you have an opinion, or if you have something to add, please go ahead. Do you have anyone questions? All right. Can you still hear me? Can anyone still hear me, though? Yes, I can. can. All right. Awesome. So I think we don't have we don't have anyone with questions. So thank you very much. Uh, so um, I think that will be it for me today. Contact me if you have help, if you need help um i wish you the best of luck and you know sorry. it's a wonderful time yeah I'm go ahead i'm sorry please are we going to get this slide yes yes we will okay. yes you will you will thank you very much for your time i really wish you a wonderful evening thanks everyone bye-bye thank you bye-bye Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.